The next presentation will be by an avatar of a dear friend of mine and a superb scholar who happens to be the wife of uh, Dr. Muszynski. Her main job is to crack the whip so to produce things that I'm interested in. But she, in her spare time, produces other things too. Uh, she sent us a paper, she couldn't be here, between politics and, for family reasons, between politics and charity work or social work, the study of women activists um, within the ranks of the Polish national movement, 1919-1939. Well, the story start, starts much earlier. It's not in the paper, so I'll just say that in the wake of failed Polish uprisings, in the wake of persecution, confiscations, deportations to Siberia, executions. A, some Polish patriotic activists decided to concentrate on organic work, lay low, organize at the grassroots, perform char charity and social work. The second generation, following 1863, decided to go one step further. They combined their charity and social work, so teaching peasant girls how to learn a trade. They combined it with uh, patriotic nationalist activities. And they were the most astonishing batch of women before anybody had ever thought anywhere about uh, feminism. And they were not addenda to men, they were standalone. That is, they operated in conjunction with the larger nationalist movement, but they did practically everything by themselves. They were powers behind the many thrones in the Polish civil society that wasn't supposed to exist under the partitions. And they were the ones who emerged during World War I openly, first in the wake of the revolution of 1905 and then during World War I, and afterwards to unveil their particular vision of how the nation ought to be constituted. So I'd like to ask Maria to channel Dr. Mushinska, Mishyakovska, and, uh, and tell us all about women, Polish women. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. It is my great pleasure to present to you a paper by Dr. Jolanta Mishyakovska. Between Politics and Social Work, a Study of Women's Activities Within the Ranks of the Polish National Movement, 1919 and 1939. In 1918, the reborn Poland became one of the first countries in Europe where women got the right to vote before France and England. One tends to treat this fact as a gift or a goodwill gesture from, the, from Józef Piłsudski, the Poland's chief of state. Nothing could be farther from the truth. The new law passed on the 28th November 1918 legitimize the women's well-deserved right to active participation in the public sphere. The right to vote meant the right to take responsibility for the shape of the independent state, its legal, social and political system. Approaching in 2019 a 100th anniversary of the first parliamentary elections in Poland after the Great War seems to be a perfect opportunity to reconsider Polish women's path to emancipation. I want to concentrate on those women who are taking part in the national democracy, best known as the Polish National Movement. They were struggling for equality based on the firm belief that both women and men should have equal rights and also similar obligations. The conservative women's campaign aimed to make Poles equal on every basis. I intend to give some examples of their efforts on the political, social and ideological scene. The creator of the unchallenged leader of the national democracy was Roman Dmowski. 
His visionary ideas, created towards the end of the 19th century, changed the Poles' way of thinking about the, their nation for good. Even more, Dmowski was an ideologue and a politician who created the modern vision of the Polish nation. His best-known words, I am a Pole, so I have Polish duties, comprise the essence of the Polish national movement's ideology. The nation was looking to an achievable unity, even if the Polish state has not existed yet. In Dmowski's eyes, the only determinant of affiliation to the Polish nation was a sense of Polishness and willingness to act in favor of its welfare. He did not hesitate to name the Polish faults. His masterpiece, The Thoughts of the Modern Pole, published for the first time in 1902, became the core of the National Democracy Program. Dmowski's notable achievement was a shift in the Polish approach to regaining independence. He distinguished the real politic from the romantic illusions, thus giving Pol Polish people a choice how to become independent. According to Dmowski, the best strategy was an unsentimental calculation. He claimed that in politics there was no place either for an, for an affection or a dislike. The most important was to be effective in achieving the goal of protecting the Polish reason of state. Dmowski strongly rejected the romantic idea of an uprising as a way to achieve independence. His point of view was determined by the situation in the international arena. In terms of the annexationist consistent politics, every attempt at armed resistance would be doomed to failure. Winning independence would move the Polish cause from the realm of internal Russian affairs to the international arena. National democracy was genuinely unique in Europe uh, from the end of the 19th um, and the beginning of the 20th century. It was one of the most critical and influential ideological communities in the Second Polish Republic. Strictly speaking, the key to its success lay not only in the structure's activity. A vast range of social actions provided unswerving support to the national movement. Many associations, open and conspiratorial, were acting resiliently among Polish women and men. The organizers came from different social backgrounds, various professional environments, and possessed varying financial standing. Nevertheless, Poles of mixed backgrounds were able to unite for the sake of the Poland's common good. Such an extent of social activity would not have been possible without women's involvement. Even though they gained political rights only in 1918, the Polish women had been playing a significant role before winning independence. I wish to distinguish the representatives of two generations and present their methods of activity. Both of them may pride themselves on extraordinary political and social achievements. The first age group is known as the rebellious generation. These women were born at the, age of, at the end of the 19th century in the Russian, German and Austrian partitions, and they grew up in the era of bloody repression. All those persecutions were the consequence of two unsuccessful uprisings, both the November uprising between 1830 and 1831 and the January uprising in 1863 were ruthlessly suppressed by the Russians. Next, the labor of young Polish women on the cusp of the 1920s and the 1930s is worth considering. They were members of the independent Polish generation, youngsters who did not suffer from slavery. This age group grew up in the independent state, yet their activity was determined by the difficult political and economic situation in Europe. The growth of fears of another war was pushing Polish women to take far-reaching action. Given the vast extent of the national movement's activities, we need to discuss both generations. Under Russian, excuse me, Polish women had been providing for decades of slavery, uh, had been proving for decades of slavery that thanks to their efforts, Polish identity survived. Wishing to understand their motivation for the promotion of, patri of patriotism, we need to consider this matter in its full social and cultural context. As I mentioned, the activity against the depolonization was one of the most fundamental fields of Polish women's labor before the Great War. Until 1918, the main base of Polish patriotic activity was their families. Women were imparting to their children the love for the non-existent homeland. 
They were teaching youngsters secretly at home, even though this activity exposed female, female teachers to the risk of repercussions. Home education covered Polish history, culture and religion, and what is highly significant, these lessons were given in the native language. School teachers were subject, subjecting Polish pupils to rough Russification and Germanization. This is why growing up in this patriotic atmosphere at home had such an essential impact. Children needed to get used to speaking Russian or, Gen or German at school, but thanks to their mother's efforts, they had a strong sense of self-identity. As time went by, women were expanding their range of activities. They, found ch uh, they founded charities, spread education among local communities, and with the most which was the most re relevant, inspired more and more Poles to join in those efforts. National Democracy Women members were involved in the National League and its front organizations. The League was an elite group of intellectuals. They successfully organized the National Movement's conspiratorial activity before the advent of political mass movements. The members of the National League, created by Roman Dmowski in 1893, were the prominent women activists, among others Zofia Sokolnicka and Gabriela Balicka, the future deputies. Direct involvement of former women's generations in strengthening national identity made the patriotic activity a natural choice for their daughters and granddaughters. They were inspired by the fates of women from their immediate environment, often the family members. Many of the women voters' ancestresses were fighting at the fronts of the uprisings. Female participants of the November and January uprisings were taking care of the wounded and their relatives. Consequently, they were arrested and exiled to Siberia. For instance, a great-grandmother of, of Wanda Wajina, one of the leading activists, took part in the November uprising. That is why Wanda Wajina decided to get involved in political activity in the independent Poland. Polish families had also been attending memor memorial ceremonies, commemorating fallen husbands, brothers and sons, for many years. In the Polish territories snatched by the Russian Empire, the preservation of memory was fo a form of defiance. In national democracy's eyes, an autonomous woman was undoubtedly also a free Pole. The main difference between the Polish emancipation movement and such movements in Western Europe was that all social and political inequalities were viewed as an annexationist policy rather than deliberate discrimination against women. The direct connection between making Poland independent again and working for women's rights is worth delineating. Poland's independence and adopting universal suffrage radically changed women's situation within the united Polish lands. Jędrzej Moroczewski's government's decision to organize the first parliamentary election on the 26th January 1919 led to the political mobilization of all Poles. What was significant was that for the first time the franchise was extended to all men and women over 20 now, 21. <laughs> Coming just after the end of the Great War, it was the first time when millions of citizens were allowed to debate an important state affair. Consequently, the Polish people stood at a crossroads. As the women's movement during the Russian, German and Austrian partitions recruited its members among the elites, only a small number of women were prepared to take part in the public sphere. Nevertheless, thanks to their le leadership potential, national democracy female activists succeeded in mobilizing the supporters of the national ideological community. In the first in instance, in December 1918, they instituted the National Electoral Organization of Women, Narodowa Organizacja Wyborcza Kobiet. A female association set up to organize a political campaign supporting the national movement. This formidable team of intellectuals was working under the leadership of, among others, Gabriela Balicka. Despite her tragic life, this doctor of botany played a crucial role on the political scene in the Polish Second Republic. According to her, the most vital task was, no doubt, to find a way to encourage Polish women to exercise their newly gained rights. Indeed, participation in the election was Polish women's most important civic, civic duty. However, low national awareness of the vast majority of female voters 
seemed an unsurmountable obstacle in the accomplishment of this task. National democracy's female leaders decided to face this difficult challenge, and they won. The first step to the achievement of the goal above was branching out the activities of the National Electoral Organization of Women in every possible way. The full range of national democracy's means of communication entailed political pamphlets, electoral posters, flyers, and mass meetings. In this political environment, all necessary measures were taken to disseminate propaganda successfully. Time proved those efforts right. Female National Democracy Leaders' Campaign made Polish women aware of the importance of their choices for the reborn state's future. Consequently, many conservative women were convinced to support National Democracy's ambitions. The vicious winter campaign on the cusp of 1918 and 1919 mobilized all ideological communities who claimed the right to represent Polish citizens' aspirations. Political parties derived from these movements, <coughs> socialist, peasant, and nationalist, were canvassing for votes, thus making the public debate very heated. National democracy stood on a platform of developing a political program based on the concept of solidarity. Nationalists under Roman Dmowski's leadership reconciled individual and social interests for the sake of the national good in opposition to what they believed was a socialist false paradise. Furthermore, Polish nationalists were warning against the communist threat, ferociously criticizing their red opponents. These debating points reinforce national democracy's influence among female voters. In fact, the political stance of women, generally regarded as conservative, was taken as a must by the female leaders. The campaign mobilized women from a wide range of social backgrounds to vote, resulting in mass female participation in the parliamentary election on the 26th January 1919 had a decisive role. It ensured the national movement's victory. To the socialist movement leaders surprise, the national, the national Democrats were catapulted into power. The socialists seemed to be disappointed to find that their opponents won thanks to the piece of legislation put forward by the Jędrzej Moraczewski, himself a socialist government. Nevertheless, the National Democratic Coalition won a majority in the parliament and became the most important political player. The women of Poland were the first to benefit from the first parliamentary election in January 1919. They did indeed proclaim their positive attitude towards the reborn country. Also, the election result demonstrated the power of women's voices in the formation of public opinion. National democracy's success allowed to hope that women of all social classes would be inspired to exercise their rights in the future. As time went by, this drive, which had led to the electoral victory, seemed to be gaining momentum, and the right-wing women's fame continued to increase. Encouraged by their success, the leaders of the National Electoral Organization of Women decided to spread their activity widely in the public sphere. They were particularly thrilled about bringing Polish women closer to right-wing ideas and incentivizing them to work for the sake of the common good. In this way, in May 1919, a new association was brought to life, the National Organization of Women, Narodowa Organizacja Kobiet. It was believed by many that working under the leadership of highly intelligent, politically aware women, the association would slowly move from the realm of the national movement ideology into the sphere of practice. In 1919, two representatives of the right wing, Zofia Sokolnicka and Gabriela Balicka, won places in the parliament. Furthermore, their names were discussed in every political circle. Being both capable and intelligent, these two leaders shared a desire to improve the lot of women less fortunate than themselves. That is why national democracy activists were declaring they were acting for all women all over Poland. The right-wing women were combining their efforts at the parliamentary forum with community involvement. 
They were demanding equality of rights and were working on changing the way women were treated by the law. Moreover, they were supporting Polish women's independence. They were lecturing on the consequences of civic duties, giving speeches relevant to the domestic and international situation in a language comprehensible to an average audience. Thanks to that, their ideas were easily, <clears throat> easy to communicate. Indeed, the National Organization of Women's Activists were joyfully received by their listeners. <laughs> Meanwhile, the socialist movement's leaders intended to fuel class antagonism, adopting radical ideas. The national movement politicians were aware that economic and social distress, especially in industrial and multi-ethnic areas, have always been the hotbeds of socialist and communist demagogy. Political disagreement was in the air, but the scale of it could not be foreseen. In response to the left-wing political propaganda, the National Organization of Women tried to make working-class women aware of true colors of leftist ideology. The female leaders in the national movement were aware of the size of the task ahead, but at the same time, they felt very strong need to show the power of solidarity. The effectiveness of their political propaganda successfully countered the left-wing canvassing. Their work in the field of politics was limited to the traditional female areas, education, charity, social and cultural activity. However, contrary to popular belief, their political involvement did not perpetuate the stereotypes. In the case of these highly gifted women, their marital status did not matter. Among women who shared the same party's political beliefs were unmarried women and those who resolved not to have children. Interesting is that the most forceful personalities among women who felt allegiance to the right-wing cause lived an un unconventional way. Their lives were repeatedly marked by adversities. Maria Holder Egarova lost her beloved daughter. Zofia Sokolnicka involved herself in social work in spite of her severe disease. Gabriela Balicka, despite her more than average intelligence and political talents, was not meant to know personal happiness. Her life was tragically marked by her fateful relationship with Zygmunt Balicki, the co-creator and ideologist of the Polish national movement. Deserted by him, she suffered for the rest of her life. Having lost everything instead of giving up, many activists decided to fight. The tragedy of their lives would have a direct positive impact on their political and social involvement. Balicka drafted the act abolishing legal restrictions regarding all women. The campaign undertaken by Balicka culminated in introducing significant changes to the legal system. She was fighting for women's rights to spend their own money, to be allowed to earn money, and to be allowed to own and retain property. She believed that these issues would impact their everyday domestic li lives. Thanks to Balicka's efforts, the act was passed on the 1st July 1921. The right-wing leaders opted for women's participation in public administration. The only criterion was their abilities and skills and requirements which they needed to fulfill to be employed. These demands were supported by action, a proposal to make women's and men's salaries equal. Furthermore, in 1924, a discussion about the women's social role was joined by Maria Holder Egerova. She firmly believed that both working outside the house and being a mother and a social activist is possible. Indeed, the, por <clears throat> the portrait of right-wing representatives who led politically active life seems to be undoubtedly interesting. They had been shaping the Polish political scene until 1926, when, in the wake of Józef Piłsudski and his military junta's coup d'etat, the Polish parliamentary system collapsed. Józef Piłsudski's coup d'etat and the military takeover of the country in May 1926 was disastrous for the Polish parliamentary system. Authoritarian government style brought on severe repression of the political opposition, including the outlawing of some of the national movement's organizations. Internments without trial, brutal, brutal treatment of political prisoners, electoral fraud, heavy press censorship, erosion of the fundamental civil rights, 
all became part and parcel of the public sphere after 1926. National movement's leaders learned their lesson quickly. Young activists' mood was far too radical to accept the oppressive state of affairs. They put their trust in Roman Dmowski, who had the talent and the ability to cope with the crisis the right wing faced under the Piłsudski regime, so-called Sanacja. The strategy set in motion by Dmowski turned out to be successful. He actively involved himself in the manage management of youth associations, taking advantage of the growing radicalization of political parties and student unions to make them more professionally organized. Polish political scene was becoming increasingly polarized. In 1926, he founded the Camp of Great Poland, Obóz Wielkiej Polski, which was banned by Piłsudski's dictatorship in 1933. Next year, Roman Dmowski gave his blessing to the efforts of two politicians, Jan Mosdorf and Henryk Rossmann. In 1934, Mosdorf instituted the National Radical Camp, Obóz Narodowo Radukalny. Soon afterwards, as a consequence of an increasingly critical view of the government's activities, its activity in the public sphere was prohibited. These experiences pushed the patience of the young people to its limits and echoed the contemporary national movement's political thinking. For the national radical camp, like the camp of Great Poland before, women and men were together. This combined effort for the sake of the good of the nation confirmed extraordinary abilities of some women. The intellectuals and the political activists Maria Sucheni, Maria Żątkowska, Maria Rutkowska, Maria Judycka and Alina Rosman argued convincingly that women could be fulfilled in political and social activity and academic work. Only the individual qualifications determined a life path. Young Polish women and men shared the same view about the need to unite for the common good of the state. In the period of 1920s and 1930s, a generational movement, women and men, rather than a women's movement, conceptualizes better the spirit of the epoch. At that point, the scale of women's involvement in the national movement noticeably increased. Young Poles were visible in political party structures, the popular national union, Związek Ludowo Narodowy, and the national party, Stronnictwo Narodowe. Besides, they were involved in social organizations like the Polish Youth Association, Młodzież Wszechpolska, and in youth political organizations, for instance, the Camp of Great Poland and the National Radical Camp. The level of their ac academic activity, dominated by the national movement's radical activists, increased as well. Female students played a vital role in the academic republic, <coughs> providing, for instance, the self-help activity for the fraternal help. Indeed, the right-wing women activists provided a fresh perspective and sharply criticized how the left-wing women's organizations viewed the female emancipation. Even more so, the national movement's female leaders considered that left-wing point of view was an anachronism that failed to address the challenges of modernity. Socialist ideas were perceived as having a very damaging effect on the Polish women's political activation. Centering on women's interests backfired and seemed to remote in relation to the common good. In the right wing women's eyes, all members of the society, especially when it comes to external threats, must place the common good above any private or class advantages. These women's attitude towards an aggression threatened country did not change during the interwar period. In this regard, social conflicts fell into decline. In the late 1930s, public mood in Poland changed. The unrest arose from the unsuccessful attempts by the European powers to stop Nazi Germany aggressive politics towards the countries in Central and Eastern Europe. The global struggle for German, and for German control of Europe created new tensions, making the specter of New World War very serious. Political omens were therefore not particularly promising. National movement's real politic recognized the need to avoid conflict with both Poland's powerful neighbors, Germany and Russia. In this political and social sphere, female activists were publishing passionate polemics about the women's role in the modern society. They authored ideological publications and wrote many political pamphlets which were widely distributed. The right-wing female activists were very attentive to whatever was going on 
on the domestic and international political arena. They devoted large amount of energy to monitoring social and political changes. Fear of the rising German power in Europe and the threat to the Soviet Russia determined the policy debate as well as public opinion. The intellectual achievements of the national movement's female members have been uncontested. In the Second Polish Republic, they contribute to the organization of political and social structures. They criticize revolutionary concepts of class conflict and gender conflict. They rejected the legacy of the left-wing women's associations and their way of thinking about the female emancipation. The national movement's women were acting on the premises of modern national community in which women's and men's activity in the public sphere fortify each other. The core of the national movement's political thought was the affirmation that both women and men had equal rights but different duties. In the interwar period, the two generations of women, the rebellious generation and the independent Poland generation, were linked by the national movement's ideology. Its essence was persistent, only the approach to the activities was being adjusted depending on the domestic, political and social conditions as well as the situation on the international arena.